Cracking the interview is about knowing more than the interviewer. The interviewer usually is very cocky initially. The market is filled with junior engineers. They almost have no at the back of their head. But eventually you need to convince them to a yes uh, by showing that you know more than them. The first project that we were building in Super 30, I thought, you know, three days is good enough, but people are taking a week. Some people might take two weeks, which is fine. Give your friend some amount, ke bhai ye le, 20,000 rupees. If I fail in this challenge, you keep the 20,000 rupees. Have some sort of accountability in place. These are like very hard to build as businesses. This shows core interest. I'm not saying he got a job because of this. I'm just saying, you know, he was smart. When I talked to him, it felt like Haan, isko, isne kar kar liya. I wrote a bunch of things over here. A lot of things he figured out himself and then explained to me. And I was like, hmm, this doesn't come All right, project ideas to build in the next three months. The motivation for this video comes from the last video where I talked through an on-site program that I'm running. And most of you had some challenges in the comments. So I thought, why not post a bunch of projects that might be good for you to build in the next three months. That's anyways what's happening on site. People are building a lot of projects. Um, although, you know, the motivation to build stays a little bit higher when you're on site with people, doubts are getting solved and you know, whatever. You go into depths of problems, try to build a product that's being tested. So do that. Um, I mean, the only thing that you have to do to let's say compete with Super 30 or you know, be at par with people over there is make sure you're building a project like you would in a company, own the project, make sure it's tested end to end, make sure you've covered every functionality. All the projects that we're building are slightly hard to write uh, and sometimes understand as well. The architecture will be a little weird, but if you Google enough, you should be able to figure out the right architecture. These are the stacks that we'll be sort of covering and you can pick and choose which stack to build these in. Some of these can only be built in Golang. Some of these can only be built in React Native, but Mota Mota, feel free to pick a stack. I would urge you to keep switching stacks so you can, you know, pick one project, move to a different one and decide uh, which one, which niche do you want to go into eventually. Also like companies hire for, you know, any of these roles, a job opportunity comes left, right and center. So you, it's good for you to be prepared in all of these stacks. I think three months is if you have basics cleared, right? If you know the month stack, maybe basics of Golang, the next sprint of three months would decide whether or not you're really good at this specific stack. Cracking the interview is about knowing more than the interviewer. So the way interviews are happening right now, I mean, at least in startups is the interviewer usually is very cocky initially um, because most people are, you know, whatever junior engineers or the market is filled with junior engineers. So they've almost, they almost have no at the back of their head. But eventually you need to convince them to a yes uh, by showing that you know more than them. Harkirat, how would I know more than an engineer in a company? The good thing about an engineer in the company is that they're very focused on a very specific stack. Uh, and you know, they've been solving that problem for a long time. Some engineers are, you know, handling 10 different things, usually tech leads and staff engineers, but most, you know, SD1, SD2s are sort of restricted in how much they can learn on the go because they have a lot of day-to-day -day tasks to deal with. So it's not too difficult to know more than them in, you know, various stacks at least cover more breadth of things and know them better than they do. So your job during an interview is going to be convincing them that you know more than them and, you know, they will try to keep grilling you more and more on whatever problem statement they're working on. Most interviews are happening like this, at least, you know, in the companies that we are referring to, they will ask you, have you worked on this? Have you worked on a similar problem? Let's say the company that's hiring is a social network. They'll ask you to build a social network, ask you the challenges over there because they're seeing those challenges firsthand. Uh, and you need to know enough, you're able to make as much as they are currently making. And then maybe a little bit more, suggest a few better architectures. I think that's a great way to convince an interviewer. The very first project that I would suggest you build is a metaverse app. This isn't a simple CRUD app. It would require a lot of things uh, to, you know, make it work. What's hard to do when you're building such projects is figure out ke where should I stop? So over here, I think the point to stop would be when you've built something like this, which is anyone can come and create a virtual space. People can join that virtual space as avatars, move around and, you know, interact with other people. We have a gather town space for super 30 as well where all the online folks sort of reside. This is the one. So I can just move around, go to someone's desks, for example, Sujit's desk, he's currently away from the tab. If I want, I can ping him and, you know, talk to him. If he's there, he'll come up and you know, we can talk to them. Most online people were suggesting to sort of stay in this online uh, space. So if they have doubts, they can, you know, ask TAs. Sujit is one of the TAs in Supath. Oh, there we go. Hey, Sujit. Hello. What are you working on? We are just chilling. Oh, you're just chilling? Celebrating Sunday? Oh, oh boy, what the fuck? <laughs> nice. <laughs> All right. I was recording a video. Hey, Anzala, I'll send it to you for an edit in like five minutes. We are getting a video to edit in five minutes. Cool. All right. Uh, okay. So are you going, going to the office? Yeah, you'll chill there only. I'm going to the office. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead with the office. Fairly decent-ish PMF product market fit in building a product like this. Um, for those of you who don't know, I've also worked at Gather for almost a year. So I understand the architecture fairly well, the challenges. I can tell you the biggest challenge here is video communication because, you know, you have to be connected to a few people, disconnected from other people as you move around. Um, and if you look at their hiring page right now, also they're hiring mostly video engineers. Uh, so you'll have to understand WebRTC, you'll have to understand real-time communication that requires, you know, as you move around, other people move around, you get their whatever. Uh, avatars um, you'll understand game engines uh, you shouldn't build this by yourself there are very famous game engines that let you build something like this so try to use a game engine uh, phaser is a popular one um, that's used in most such companies that are building 2d games if you're building 3d games then you might have to go with 3js or babylon js uh, character animation is another thing you need at least for something like this as i move to the left my face faces the left right how can people design characters how can you integrate characters in a system like this uh, Distributed systems, Gather has a very big scale. When I was there, there were like 250 backend servers, 100 video servers that are up all the time. Um, how do these servers talk to each other? How do you make sure, you know, if Harkir is connected to server one, Sujit is connected to server two, they are able to communicate with each other, both in terms of their video and their, you know, avatar movements. The tech stack I would recommend here, probably go with Mern. If this is your very first project that you're building anyways, uh, and MERN is much easier to write, you know, just write it in MERN stack, you will need a WebSocket server, you will need an HTTP server, you will need a WebRTC server, and you'll need the front end. So probably four services you will need in the end. Um, I'm leaving it fairly vague purposely, uh, purposefully, but if you figure out the architecture and you write it in a Notion doc, feel free to comment it below. I'll review it in the comments and let you know, you know, what I would change, what I would not change. Um, but I would urge you to first write the architecture for this because there are a lot of systems to build before you can say, you know, you're building something like Gather. Uh, probably take you a month, especially if you're building front end as finished as this one. And if you're learning WebRTC for the first time. All right, that's the first idea. 2D Metaverse app, just go to gather.town. You can also explore it. Second one is Hinge. Uh, there's no reason to do this. We needed to do a mobile application. I asked Satyam, what are good ideas to build? This is one of them that he suggested. Uh, there are a few backend challenges here. So, you know, this is learning React Native, but also learning a bunch of things on the backend. Specifically, if you've heard of Bloom filters, uh, they may become useful over here. Harkirat, what are Bloom filters? Uh, there are data structure that let you optimize certain types of reads. For example, what happens in a game like this, if you can design the schema in your head is, I will swipe right and swipe left on a bunch of people. When I swipe right, swipe left, you know, keep going. This is an N cross N data structure. In your database, you will have to store all the matches and unmatches that I've done in the past. Uh, an easier way to store this with some false positives is a Bloom filter. Harkirat, what is a false positive? Google this a bit. False positive means it might happen that I might see the same person again or I might skip someone I should have seen. But that is fine in an application like this if it gives you faster lookup times when you're trying to match. So one thing you might learn on the backend in case you implement it the right way is Bloom filters, proximity search. I need to make sure I only, uh, you know, connect to people around me, very similar to Google Maps. If I search for restaurants near me, it needs to find restaurants near me. So how does that search happen? It'll teach you a little bit about vector search. Mobile app development, their UI isn't too complicated, but at the same time, cloning a UI, you know, end-to-end -end pixel perfect is really hard. There are some, you know, native functionalities that you need to uh, implement, things like uh, gesture swipes. React Native makes it fairly easy, so it's not too difficult to build. But again, all of these will help you sort of understand uh, number one, mobile development, number two, some slightly advanced backend. Uh, and mobile app UI design, I write this because, yeah, amongst the many apps that exist currently, I think Hinge has cracked the UI for youngsters and you know everyone uses these this these days uh so figure out what that is and you know try to clone it uh cool hopefully that's straightforward shouldn't take more than 15 days to build uh probably lesser i would spend most of my time on react native over here and make sure i understand how react native can be used to build an application like this and deploy it on the app store play store ai automation tool that's the third idea um i'm sure you guys can build zapier or you know you know what zapier is hopefully if not it's an automation tool. What that means is you can come to their website and build a bunch of blocks like these. For example, here I've built a block. Okay, there is a starting point of the block where you can give a title as an input. The title, let's say, is five project ideas to build in 2024, which will spit out or generate an image by talking to an image generation model, which will probably then talk to, once this image is built, talk to another image generation model to, let's say, swap my face, you know, swap the face of the actor for my face. So that a thumbnail is finally generated for me that I can post everywhere. So this is what's called a workflow. Okay, when one task happens, let's say I upload the video, YouTube video to my dashboard, an asynchronous, you know, event spins up, which does task number one, then does task number two. I could add another task over here to 
cut the shots from this specific YouTube video and then post them on Instagram. This will help you do like understand asynchronous backend communication really well. This is why this was one of the projects in cohort two. Uh, but more than that, this is, you know, slightly more advanced than building Zapier. It's an AI Zapier. The screenshot is from, I forgot the name again of the company. I keep forgetting the name. I'll post it somewhere in the description. But this company basically, and you know, a bunch of other companies uh, got into this niche, raised a lot of money for building um, AI based workflow or, you know, AI based automation tools. Uh, and it'll teach you a lot about backend and talking to a bunch of GPT slash, you know, image generation model APIs. Uh, I went through their code base, nothing too complicated. If you do want to make it complicated, you should look through Comfy UI. If you are interested in, you know, building your own UI where people can come and create extremely complex image generation workflows, uh, then you should look at open Comfy UI. It's open source, slightly complicated. If you want to build something sim simple where you're just talking to GPT APIs or, you know, various image generation model APIs, this is fairly simple. The difficult bit here would be asynchronous backend communication, GPT APIs, which are you know not too difficult, not GPT APIs, more technically, you know, image generational model APIs. Uh, yeah, this one I would recommend you write in Python uh, for a bunch of reasons. Number one, it's a common stack. So knowing fast API Django is a good thing. Plus most of the, you know, libraries that you will be using to talk to an, uh, an image generational model will be in Python. So it makes sense for your whole stack to be in Python. Most YC companies that are currently being, you know, getting into batches are AI companies. Most of them have their backends, even their centralized backends, not just the ML bits in Python. So it makes sense for you to, you know, learn Python th through this project, even though you can build it in Node.js or whatever, I would recommend you build this project in Python. Stack would be Python, React and React Native in case you want an end user mobile app where the user can track, you know, the output of these workflows. I can see ki, huh, this is the final thumbnail that has been generated for the video that I just uploaded on my YouTube dashboard. I think this is the last one. Second last games. Um, yeah, again, this is like, these are harder to build than a CRUD app, which is the only reason I'm recommending it. Uh, I could have recommended a e-commerce app as well, which is, I'm sure it's very easy to build. You can build it in a day. The things that we're talking about rarely touch databases, uh, because all of these are, you know, highly real time, a game being another such example, Ludo King has more than a billion downloads. Uh, so it's a good business. Uh, and you know, there are multiple such applications on the app store. There are companies, you know, creating new games on the app store play store every day because they if they catch the viral loop they can become really big this being one such example so how can you build a game like ludo king where people can come let's say bet 10 rupees on both the sides start paying ludo against each other and the person who wins takes most of the pot some of the pot goes to the company in this case ludo king um how can you build this not too difficult to build like a 2d game like like a two-player game like this uh, the harder bits are uh yeah, making it really fast. Um, if you're storing things in the database, then that's a problem. Most of these companies are not storing things in the database. They're storing it in memory. What happens if your server dies in case you're storing things in memory, a bunch of these companies just refund. If two people are playing a game and their data gets lost because the server that they were running on crashed, they just refund people on both the sides. So how can you build a better architecture? This is the thing that if you tell to the interviewer during an interview, they'll be super impressed. We have not also yet figured out okay, what if our server dies, which has in-memory data, how do we recover the state from it? Uh, if these are architectures that you know, and you can think of them from first principles. It's a good, you know, thing to tell to the, to the interviewer. You'll understand about game engines again, if you want to build it in Unity, even though I would recommend, you know, you simply build it in React Native for now, you know, have simple native elements rather than going with a game engine, even though a bunch of these companies do use, you know, Unity and game engines. Um, you'll understand about real-time communication, very similar to Gather Town, how you can you send real-time events and receive real-time events from server. Server state management, this is the complicated bit that I'm talking about. Okay, a lot of times state is not stored in a database, but a server. How can you do state management over there? Distributing via APKs, a bunch of these are not legal slash, you know, have some level of regulatory risk. So they're not published on the app store. So you have to publish them as, you know, uh, whatever, independent APKs on websites. How can you do that? Uh, fairly simple stuff. Uh, operational, yeah. The one thing in building something like this is you need to figure out licenses. Um, there are a lot of licenses and I, I'm super surprised when I talk to someone here, okay, there's a random number generation license in India, which is basically as the name suggests, they make sure they audit your code and, you know, make sure your random number generation logic is truly random and that you're not changing that logic as your, you know, code base progresses. Uh, so there are a bunch of these licenses you need in case you want to build a system like this. Uh, you don't have to figure this out, you know, the BD people will, but it's good for you to know, okay, you can't just distribute this on day zero. You will run into a bunch of challenges unless you're distributing via APKs, in which case it's fine. Yeah, you don't need any licenses, even though that sounds borderline shady and illegal. 
I would use Golang for backend, React Native for frontend. Um, most companies like these are using React Native for iOS, but you know, native Android for uh, native for Android. So feel free to pick, you know, Kotlin if need be. But even though I would suggest, you know, the React Native is good enough. You can build an application like this using React Native, and you know, this is where you can get that experience. Um, that's pretty much it for games. This is one game you can think of any two-player game where you make people pull in money in the center, and you know, the winner takes most of it, and the platform takes some. That's a good business. Uh, and at peak, I think these platforms have like 200,000 people active, live, playing against each other at the same time. All of those people are losing money. You know, one side is making money, one side is losing money, but you are making money on all of these games. So that's a lot of money in the long run. Alrighty, uh, last one. That's build something from scratch, a deep tech project. From time to time, your discussions will go in this direction um, in an interview. For no reason, I mean, I think if, if you've run out of options, if the interviewer has run out of options, you've explained everything right, they might dive deeper into this generally also for computer science knowledge for having a conversation with someone. It's good to know how do you build something like a database from scratch. Uh, we have a repository called request for code, where I posted something like this. Okay, let's after the Bitcoin class, okay, let's build a Bitcoin like blockchain yourself. It's not too hard to build. A, and you know, some people did one of the person who did eventually got a First, a small offer, like 10 LP offer, eventually a 30K USD offer. Uh, I met him in Bangalore. He was one of the few people who had built it. Uh, so this shows core interest. I'm not saying he got a job because of this. I'm just saying, you know, he was smart. When I talked to him, it felt like, Haan, isko, isne kar kar liya. The, again, the things I didn't figure out. I wrote a bunch of things over here. A lot of things he figured out himself and then explained to me. And I was like, hmm, ye to mujhe nahi aata. So, you know, that becomes super impressive. Then I asked a friend to, you know, hire him first for 10 LP. He worked there for a month and then eventually got a, you know, remote offer. So, I mean, this is one page where you can look at, but you know, anything that you want to build, be it, you know, a database yourself. If you build a database, you'll understand a lot of things. The other day we were discussing this in Super 30, someone suggested, you know, one way to build databases and you know, how they're persistent uh, blockchains, neural networks. You don't ever build these slash understand their architecture. You just use them. But you know, what will you build beyond a point? And I think these are good projects to build. Pick any one of these, build it in any language, although you probably want to build it in a low level language like Golang or Rust choose Golang for now, but Rust is probably, you know, the more ideal stack for building any of these um, or C or SIG. Um, understand the internal working of these. How does a database work? How does a blockchain work? How do you make nodes communicate with each other? How neural network is the, probably the simplest one over here? How does a basic neural network whose shape is defined work? How does back, back propagation work? How can you train a model yourself, not using, you know, an external library like TensorFlow? I would use Golang as a tech stack and, you know, um, very hard market to crack. Oh, these are like very hard to build as businesses. Uh, if you're building a new blockchain, a new database, a new ML library, uh, adoption is really hard because develop, yeah, it's just a developer product. It's hard to convince developers to move from Postgres to your own database, uh, but it's a very big market. So, you know, and it's suddenly seeing a lot of funding, Bunjs, Dino, you know, Wheat have all raised. So Vercel sort of became the, you know, poster boy for building products like these because they built Next and built a business around it. So you may be able to build a business around it, but even if not, you know, you learn a lot. Cool. And that was the last slide. These are, I think, five or six projects that you can build. There are thousands of project ideas out there. I think the difficult bit is sitting down and building them. The first project that we were building in Super 30, I thought, you know, three days is good enough, but people are taking a week. Some people might take two weeks, which is fine. Um, but at least they're trying. I think the hard bit is when you just leave and, you know, do not try. So try to commit if you need a friend, you know, find a friend. Give your friend some amount. Okay, like. 20,000 rupees. If I fail in this challenge, you keep the 20,000 rupees. Have some sort of accountability in place. That'll help you, you know. Um, I don't know, just stick through it for a long run. All right. With that, let's end it. I will see you guys in the next one. Bye bye.